Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, this is a Good Grief Festival event and it's to launch a brand new grief support guide which aims to give bereaved people the information they need to find the support that's right for them. And this is a UK based um, resource. I know there's people joining from all over the world today and welcome. Uh, we hope that the methods that we've used to develop the guide and um, the content and how it looks will be relevant to your setting as well and that this could be replicated in, in other places too. So in this webinar we'll be talking about the grief support guide, what it aims to do and how it was developed and towards the end we will also have time for questions from the audience so please do write your questions in the chat and we'll take those towards the end of the session today. Uh, my name is Lucy Salmon. I'm an Associate Professor of Palliative and End-of-Life Care at the University of Bristol. Um, and since 2020, I've been working with my wonderful colleague, Emily Harrop from Cardiff University on a programme of research on bereavement. And the Grief Support Guide, which was led by Emily, is one of the outputs of this work. And we're really delighted to be joined today by Alison Penny from the National Bereavement Alliance and Amber Jeffrey, creator and founder of the brilliant Grief Gang Instagram page and podcast. So welcome, everybody. Um, Emily, it would be great if you could please introduce yourself first. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm a research fellow at the Marie Curie Research Centre at Cardiff University and have a particular interest and um, research background now in grief and bereavement research, including working with Lucy on the project that she just mentioned, as well as being quite closely involved with the work of the UK Commission on Bereavement with Alison and Lucy. Um, and and Amber was involved in that a little bit as well, weren't you, Amber? Um, and, and that was another really important piece of work that's kind of informed the guide we're going to be talking about today. Thank you, Emily. Um, Alison, would you be able to go next? Thanks, Lucy. Um, it's great to be with you all today. Um, I'm Alison Penny. Um, I've got three hats on today. One is as coordinator um, of the National Bereavement Alliance, um, which brings together uh, national organisations and regional networks um, supporting bereaved people, um, primarily in England, um, but um, with, with good links um, across the UK as well. Um, I'm also director of the Childhood Bereavement Network, um, which is a UK wide network for organisations working uh, with bereaved children and young people. Um, and I'm also a bereaved daughter as well. So um, although my um, uh, professional experience is, is coming into play today, um, I'm also thinking about how useful I, I would have found um, the guide and uh, being um, sort of better signposted to organisations 25 years ago when, when my dad died. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you, Alison and Amber. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, yeah, it's really, really lovely to be with you all today and with the audience as well. Uh, as Lucy mentioned earlier, I'm Amber Jeffrey, and I'm the uh, creator and founder of the Grief Gang uh, online community podcast and now mentoring as well. And so my, my story stemmed back for a brief introduction back in uh, 2016 when my mum, I'm also a bereaved daughter, uh, died of a very sudden heart attack. And uh, I very much struggled to find support Support that was right for me and so therefore I created my own support for myself um, in the form of a podcast and an online platform and just chatted away online and that was born in 2019 and has since then grown from strength to strength amazingly and been able to be a support system for for many people um, and I've also been uh associated with the Good Grief Festival for, for quite some time and participating in their events and I just love the work uh, that that you're all doing and with the Commission on Bereavement and further with this guide as well as you said Alison um, this guide just imagining if I had that back in you know as not that long ago of 2016 potentially how different that might have been for uh, my bereavement journey and finding that support would have been just paramount so really looking forward to exploring the guide further here today and uh, discussing finding the right support for people. Thank you so much Amber, I really appreciate um, you all joining us today. Um, so first of all I think it would be really helpful Emily if you could please um, start by just telling everyone a bit about the Grief Support Guide and why it was developed. Yes of course, so um, I mean the sort of origins really of the Grief Support Guide were in the um, research studies and the UKCB consultation that I just mentioned. Um, myself and Lucy led, led a big um, uh, study of people's experiences of being bereaved during COVID-19. We had over 700 people take part in that study. Um, and then the UK Commission on Bereavement had over 1,000 people um, take part in the consultation that they carried out, as well as a lot of different organisations. 
Um, and what came out really strongly from both the, both of those pieces of work were um, a lot of the difficulties and the barriers that people faced when trying to find support. Um, and these included um, lack of availability, but it wasn't just lack of availability. It was people not knowing where to get support, not being given in, any information on support. Um, and also not really um, people told us how they didn't really understand um, how the support could help them, you know, what it would actually be able to do for them. And also people feeling really reluctant to reach out for support, feeling uncomfortable reaching out to support. So there are these psychological barriers as well as informational barriers. Um, and so, yeah, that provide, we had on the one hand, we had all of this um, information coming out to us about, you know, the problems people have found getting support. Um, but the other side was we also, especially as the study went on, we, you know, we did a, you know, a few surveys at later time points and we did interviews with people. Um, that people did then go on to access quite a variety of different types of support um, and gave us very detailed descriptions of how they, the support then helped them. Um, and so it was thinking about these two sides to our research, really. We, we came up with the idea that actually we could probably do something that could be quite helpful to people by using our research evidence to, um, to help explain more about the types of support available and especially how the support can help people. So we looked at... Um, you know, all people's comments and what they were telling us about the ways they were being helped and identified some key patterns and what they were saying, some key themes, um, and then used these as a sort of basis, really, of the guide that we went on to develop. Um, and so, yeah, with, with that in mind, we were able to get a, a little bit of funding to go on and develop the guide, and we partnered up with um, the National Bereavement Alliance, um, with Compassionate Cymru, with, with the Good Grief Festival and with Marie Curie, um, to um, do some, do some cons further consultation work to develop the guide. Um, so I'm, I'll show you a picture of the guide that we've got here. Um, and um, yeah, so basically the, the essence of the guide really is to talk through the main um, types of support that are available. Um, so these included self-help resources, um, helplines, online communities, Facebook groups, um, bereavement support groups, um, and then um, counselling or formal one-to-one -one support um, and so for each of the support types we describe the key features of the um, support go on to have a few statements on how how the support can help and this is based on our research evidence we use some quotes from our study participants to really help tell the stories of how people have been helped and then we um, provide some signposting information for where people can go on to find out about these different types of support um, whether it's you know the main national services um, we also provide some signposting to more specialist services um, and then we also really key part of the guide is flagging the two um, main directories in the UK that um, which are at a loss and the Good Grief Trust which are really the places to go um, for more especially in particular for local um, bereavement services they provide very comprehensive directories so it wasn't something that we were setting out to replicate any in any way but it's we wanted to provide some kind of some more information on you know what the types of support are and how they can help and then tell people where to go to look to put further information on the services um so that was kind of the essence of the guide as we kind of when we started thinking about it yeah thank you emily i think that that's really helpful um and i remember some of our early conversations about what was coming out of the research you know as you flagged there were very few people in our research who were actually getting given information at the time of a death by like a health and social care professional so i think it was just um, a third of our participants said they've been given information. So it's like two thirds of our participants were just left to kind of go home and didn't really know or hadn't been given that clear information about um, what support might be available and how they could access that support really crucially as well. Um, and I think one of the things I remember us talking about at the beginning was just how overwhelmed you feel when you're bereaved as well. So one of the things we really tried to think about with the guide was kind of not providing sort of too much information to make it overwhelming, but trying to be really clear and really kind of curate just a few um, of those signposting national organisations as a way of raising awareness of them. Because if you're bereaved, you might not even know that um, at, until that point that things like the Good Week Trust or At A Loss actually exist in the first place. Um, and also just the whole range of different types of support, you know, Amber, like the kind of work you do online or the more um, informal um, uh, peer support um, that might be available. And certainly the work we do through the festival, for example, that's not something which a formal bereavement service might be aware of or a GP might be aware of. 
Um, so yes, yeah, so I wondered, Amber, whether you could maybe, you know, you mentioned how um, difficult you found it um, when your mum died really suddenly, um, Susan, when you were just 19. And I wondered if you could just reflect a little bit about um, your views of the guide or, or how useful you think it might have been for you at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Lucy. And um, yeah, you saying the word of overwhelmed of sometimes I think I think timing is I'm jumping ahead, but timing is really key as when to offer this kind of support and this guide as well, because, you know, I think getting yeah, in initial bereavement, the guide is incredible. I loved it. the table of it dropping down and just the clear direction of if you're going through this loss, try out this you know check out this resource I think it's incredible there's loads on there without it feeling that quite overwhelming feeling it's quite clear and concise so I really really enjoyed that part about the guide um and thinking back if yeah in 2016 and like I said it didn't feel it doesn't feel like that too much for long ago seven years ago but to see the huge jump and the change in how support is being offered now is just incredible and so I think, and I wonder, yeah, if I was handed something like this guide, you know, say a few months after my mum had died, I think it would have been, I wonder, I wonder if I perhaps might not have gone for it straight away, but the knowledge of knowing I had the guide of knowing, okay, maybe opening it up then might have felt, oh, wow, there's a lot out there. So it would have been quite comforting, but also, okay, ah, where to start sort of thing. But knowing that when I'm feeling ready, I can go to that and I can just flick through and then try out. And I think the biggest thing for me, um, when a, a huge part of why I started what I did was to give myself another option. It felt like at that time when I, so I initially started the first sort of mode of support that I chose was to go through one-to-one uh, -one counseling and therapy. And at the time it just wasn't a fit for me, but it did very much feel like the, it stopped there. The, the kind of support I had just stopped completely there. And then I just did the extremity and created something myself, <laughs> but not everyone should feel so inclined or want to do that of seeing where if something's not there to go and try and do it yourself, there should be presented other options. And so I wonder if at that time when I was talking to my GP and they were able to direct me to likes of other charities, organizations, podcasts, online communities, would have I be even here today is doing the grief game because I was given options. And I think for me, when finding the right support, it is about giving options because I felt a bit like a failure that I didn't quite adjust to therapy and counseling and thought, oh God, I've broken the therapist. I've done clearly something wrong. And actually at that time, it just wasn't the mode of support that I wanted or needed then and needed to be shown and shared. Okay, that's fine, Amber, if that doesn't work for you. How about we explore this? And I'm glad that I did the work that I did, um, but and I want that the work that I do to be able to be in GP rooms in directories so that when people might feel that other certain modes aren't a fit for them at that time, they have options and they don't have to sort of navigate in the dark. Thank you, Amber. Um, and I really appreciated what you said about, um, you know, trying one kind of support and then thinking, actually, this isn't really for me. You need to know what else is out there so that you're not then just left with, well, that didn't work. Now what? I'm on my own. Um, and I think I so many of you um, watching, some of you might know um, that my second daughter, Ada, was stillborn in uh, April 2018. Um, and that was one of the motivations behind creating um, Good Grief Festival um, with, you know, obviously my group of amazing collaborators. Um, and I think, you know, one of the motivations behind that for me was certainly thinking about what are the different ways that we can find community and support that aren't necessarily the sort of more formal bereavement support services. Um, but I also similarly, my experience was that when I was at the hospital and I was going home, I was given a bereavement support leaflet. Um, which I sort of stuffed in my bag and, and then a few months later I was like actually it would be quite helpful to find out what supports out there um, and I phoned the number which was a number for the hospital um, and the the line was dead and it just was like it was an old leaflet and it hadn't been updated and I think it's those kind of situations that we really tr want to try and avoid that when people actually get to the point or get the courage up to go okay I do need to try and find something 
um, that there's a whole range of different resources that they can be aware of and different things they can try out. Um, I tried um, like group peer support um, via SANS, which is a really amazing charity and they, you know, they work nationally. Um, and at certain kind of certain points in my bereavement, that was really helpful. But then I also had other points, especially when I then got pregnant again, where it became very difficult going to those groups and hearing um, other people's stories, um, of, you know, the really often terrible things that happened to them. Um, and so then I had to find a balance of like, OK, that's not really working. And I did end up going and having um, one to one um, counselling, which I found really helpful. But as you said, Amber, it's like everyone's gr grief is unique and how we cope as individuals is so unique, isn't it? Um, yeah, I don't know. Alison, um, Emily, do you have any kind of thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd um, just uh, like to come in and. I think the point that um that you were making there, Lucy, about the the, the peer support and and then one to one support and Amber um, about again about kind of having um sort of yeah sort of different inputs and different needs at, at different points. I think that's one of the things that has really struck me as we as we've been working on the guide is about kind of presenting the different types of support sort of with with equal weight and um and you know, being able to talk in a bit more detail about what's what's beneficial about each of the different types and also a little bit more about what people can can expect. Because I remember yeah. when I first started working in, in this field, which was probably about 20 years ago, and um and mostly when we talked about support, we really did it was mostly one-to-one -one support that that we talked about, um, and then and peer support for for specific groups as well. Um, and I think the way that um, different kinds of support have have blossomed over the last two decades. It is really important that we that we sort of do give those those, those kind of equal weight um, and and yeah and, and think about the yeah the, the different type of support that might fit at, at, at different points and and also making it possible for people to think actually if I try this and it doesn't feel quite right that doesn't mean there's nothing available. It just means maybe having a, um, a another look and another think about what what might be suitable. Thanks, Alison. Um, and it would be good to hear a little bit more about um, how the guide was developed and that sort of process of, of working with the different stakeholders involved. Um, Alison, I wondered if you could um, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, and it's been really interesting sort of thinking thinking back to um, that sort of first set of ideas on on the page, which I think came out so strongly from from the findings from from your research, and then thinking about the the sort of the journey and the different iterations of the guide um, through to the the the, the published and, and designed version that that we've got that we've got now. Um, so there was a, there was a lot of involvement um, from uh, bereaved people themselves into the development of, of the guide um, and also people working in bereavement services and then a kind of a really critical third group, which is um, those people who might be in contact with um, with bereaved adults or, or children as part of their role. But um, but as quite a, a, a sort of a minor part of their role, but those people that really need to know um, what to suggest or kind of how to describe the different types of support that are on offer. So people working in palliative care, um, bereavement leads in, in the health boards um, and, and colleagues working in other kind of um, signposting and referral um, places where people might go to find out about the different types of support that, that's available. So there was a, um, a stakeholder workshop held um, uh, right at the beginning of, of this year that um, looked at some, some initial ideas about the, the sort of information that the guide needed um, to, to include um, and taking views from, from each, of, um, each of those groups. And we were really um, fortunate to have the input from um, people who had um, relatively recent experience of bereavement themselves. So some people who had participated in the lived experience advisory forum that um, had um, fed in and advised um, the UK Commission on bereavement um, and also input from um, COVID bereaved families in Wales. Um, and having, having their input really early on about what was needed was really critical, I think, in developing a guide that that spoke to people's um, people's needs at a time when, as we've said, we can feel so overwhelmed um, and and actually, you know, concentration can be so difficult and so on. So it was really, really helpful to have um, to have that input. 
Um, and that then kind of led into um, a, a subsequent draft of the guide, which which then um, had uh, was kind of tested out um, and further developed um, in workshops with um, with brief people um, in 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 March. And I think some of the really key things that sort of um, came out and that changed a bit along the way. One one was around um, a really important conversation about um, how to, how to incorporate practical support alongside emotional support. So we know. Um, that people often will need a bit of um, uh, advice and guidance around um, the administrative um, processes around a death. And although there's really good information available, for example, on the gov.uk website, actually sometimes having that kind of alongside the offer of, of emotional support um, is, is really important. Um, we also um, heard how important it was to have a section um, specifically for people who were worried about their mental health um, and signposting on to um, services that can support people who are in, in crisis. Um, and we also heard about the importance of incorporating um, information about um, support for the supporters. So particularly thinking about people who might be supporting children and young people in their families um, or those with learning disabilities who might not be accessing support for themselves, um, but who need to um, uh, need to have those kind of those those gatekeepers and those people that can kind of find support um, knowing how to do that. So that was a really critical element that, that, that we incorporated. And then I think one of the other things that um, that we discussed a lot um, in in the in the stakeholder groups was about kind of how how much to include specific um, services and organisations um, in the guide, um, and there was quite a strong steer from um, from. Uh, people around the, the need for there to be some information, so some some phone numbers and some and some websites for specific national services, particularly for those that might be picking up the guide um, in in hard copy um, or those who are, who don't have um, good digital access. So there was a strong steer to include some of those, but we we know that actually the experts in kind of keeping um, uh, data up to date about the the range of services are out there that are that are out there um, lies with the signposting website. So I know that I mean at a loss I think have over sixteen hundred um, local services on on their website now and really strong filters that can help people find their way um, specifically to local services and to to national offers. So the kind of the compromise that we that we came to because we knew we we, we um, didn't want to and, and couldn't um, replicate that was to include some tables with some very specific national organizations in the back but then to kind of to signpost really clearly throughout the guide um, uh, to the signposting websites to make sure that people can can find their way to um to, to that support um and i think the final thing i just wanted to say was the thing that also came out really strongly from bereaved people looking at um versions of the guide was just about how helpful it was to hear hear directly from others about how how support had helped so i think some of the quotes that are in there about you know what was helpful um and and why they just can help you sort of get over that hurdle of picking up the phone or um or, or writing an email um knowing that other people have, have done this and it has been helpful so it was it felt um it felt a real privilege, actually, I think, to be able to use the, the voices of uh, of those that had taken part in the in the research and those then that, that took part in um, in developing the guide um, to really help encourage people um, to take up the offer of support. Thank you, Alison. And I think that's so true, because when you're bereaved, sometimes it's reading other people's stories can just really help because it helps you feel less alone. Um, and it also, as you said, I think in the context of the guide, it gives you a bit of insight into how has this type of support helped somebody else um, and what could I expect that it might help me with. Um, obviously, everybody's different, but I think um, I agree. I think having those quotes in there makes it really powerful because you've got that testimony of someone else who's been bereaved, who's who's benefited from that support. Um, Emily, did you want to add anything else about the development process or um, yeah, what what your hopes are for the guide? Um, yeah, I mean, I think Alison's given a very comprehensive account of the sort of different iterations that went through and, you know, how valuable the, the feedback was that we um, were able to collect as, as we went through that process. Um, and I was, yeah, the, I was also struck by, you know, how important the quotes were for people. That was a really positive um, thing coming mm. out. People, people talked exactly that when we took it to the focus group in March. They, they said, oh, it made them feel less alone reading the quotes and they felt much more connected with, with the guide. Um, 
So in terms of my hopes for the guide, I mean, the, the key thing for us now really is just dissemination and getting it into all of the really key places that it needs to be. So, um, you know, whether so GPs know about it, you know, funeral, you know, we're going out to funeral directors um, in hospitals, you know, just really getting it out there as much as we possibly can. Um, and yeah, make just raising awareness of it because um, you know that's that's the key thing really. So people know about it and and are able to use it. Hmm. And so everybody here who's here today, everyone in the audience, you know, please do help us spread the word as well in your networks because sometimes word of mouth is the best way um, to to raise awareness of the resources that are out there. I think. Um, and there is, so it's uh, can be downloaded from the National Bereavement Alliance um, website, and I know Katrine's already put the link um, in the page. There's also a really short feedback survey, and we'd really appreciate it if people could fill that in and let us know what they, um, what you think. You know, this will be, uh, we'll kind of be re re revisiting the guide regularly and updating it, or, uh, you know, it will evolve over time, um, depending on the feedback we receive, so I really appreciate that. <laughs> Um, and also really importantly, which we haven't talked about yet, is um, the guide is available in 10 languages, isn't it? Um, so if you go to the National Bereavement website, you can find um, downloadable versions in Bengali, Chinese, French, Gujarati, Polish, Portuguese, Romanian, Spanish and Welsh, as well as English. Um, so when people provide feedback, please also tell us what you think about the different translated versions. Um, Emily, do you want to talk uh, a little maybe about um, why it was so important to us to include those translations? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that we've been picking up in our in our you know, not everyone has the same experiences of accessing support and there are kind of known inequalities really in terms of being able to people being able to um, find out about bereavement support and then get support that you know meets their needs. Um, you know, particularly people from uh, sort of minority, minoritized ethnic backgrounds. Um, so really part of Im improving access to movement support is also making sure that, you know, where we can, that the um, information is available in different languages. So that was our motivation for um, getting the um, copies translated into these different languages. Um, and yeah, it was something that we tried to be quite mindful of when we were developing the resource but, you know in our research we you know made sure that we were looking quite specifically at the experiences of people who may have been in sort of minorities within our research um, population but we you know we made sure that we kind of focused in depth on their experiences to try and make sure that they were captured in, in all of our um, research kind of outputs um, as well as this guide um, you know, when we've been including people's quotes, um, we've tried to make sure we've included a, a mix of um, quotes from different people, whether it's from diff people from different different ethnic backgrounds, from different genders, different relationships with the person who died. Um, really, so you know, to try and again, so people can connect with the different stories as much as possible. Um, and then when we were consulting, um, and you know, we had, ran our workshops, we um, also made sure we had people from different different ethnic and cultural groups, um, and people from different organisations representing um, different um, ethnic groups as well. So yeah, we 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 hope that it, the guide is improves access for people from lots of different backgrounds. Um, but yeah, like Lucy was saying, we also really would welcome feedback on um, on the guide generally, but in particular on the translated copies, if there are people reading them from different backgrounds. Yeah. And it strikes me on the on the equity issue. There's obviously there's there's several different steps, aren't there? There's several different ways in which people are disadvantaged in terms of um, getting access to support. And sometimes it's that the bereavement support that they want or they need is not available, or it's not available in their language, or it's not available in a culturally appropriate way. Um, but there is also this gap in terms of actually knowing what support might be out there and what services are available. Um, and that's the gap that we hope this guide can help with that can actually um, just, yeah, make people a little bit more aware and empower people to go out and, um, yeah, and, and approach services, maybe feel a little bit more confident in, um, in approaching services or knowing that they do provide the kind of support that they need. Um, any other, yeah, uh, Amber? Alison, do you have any other thoughts on, on the equity issue in particular? Because I feel like that's, um, it's such a huge issue, isn't it, now in bereavement support in the UK that we're talking about much more. I've not got too much on, on the on the equity yes, sort of issue of my, my personal thoughts there. Um, I just think it's fantastic. I think sometimes having, having the guide in, in various different languages and then creating it more accessible 
it can be you know, time after time when I've worked with certain you know organizations whatever it can be the biggest barrier and it's such a shame to see that people and communities who are wanting that support have then the, the barrier of a language barrier um to stop them from getting the support that they need so to see that within here good grief festival and with all the research those steps are you know the barriers are being knocked down is really really pleasing to to see and i'm really happy the steps are being made in the right direction I think it's um yeah I mean it's going to be a, a, a long journey I don't think yeah anyone's it's feeling fine. that we're, we're there <laughs> yet but um Alison do you have any thoughts on that yeah I think there's um I mean we were so pleased to be able to make it available um in in different languages I suppose not not least but because there's something about these experiences that really rock us to to our core and kind of the, the core of our identity and sometimes then having a resource that's available in in your first language even you know even even if um uh you know you're, you're proficient and confident in english actually having having something that speaks to you in in, in kind of your um uh your, your first language can can be helpful and i think hopefully this this will start to kind of open up a bit more of a conversation about the ways in which we experience and talk about bereavement across um, across different experiences within within the UK and 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 beyond, which can only really add to a richer set of understandings of bereavement, but also of how to support one another. Um, and I'm sure that you know many of you on on the call will be thinking about the appropriateness of different types of bereavement support for um, for different groups with with different kind of attitudes to and, and beliefs about seeking help and, and what that means and, and different attitudes to um, to bereavement and and how we cope with it as well um, and so I yeah I really kind of hope that that the guide helps to kind of further some of that that conversation because it's a really important conversation and it's one that we need to be to be continuing in in all sorts of settings and uh, and and places um i think as well there's something about um yeah just kind of helping people feel comfortable with the, with the different types of of support that um that is on offer and i i i was so struck by what came out from your research um lucy and emily about the sort of about the, the the different barriers so we've talked a bit about people not being aware of services um and 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 also of course support not not necessarily being available everywhere but there were also some really powerful things that came out about people feeling that they didn't deserve support or that other people deserved it more um or yeah, some really kind of really powerful and and tricky things um, that clearly were kind of um, troubling for people. And so I, yeah, I hope that some of the the messaging in the guide can can really address some of some of those quite deep deep rooted fears that people might have about about reaching out for support. Um, yeah. And and I guess just kind of going back again to the the. To, you know making different making it clear that there are different types of support available and 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 this idea that if you know if if the first type that you try out doesn't feel right that doesn't mean that that you failed or that you're not grieving right or um that you don't fit what's on offer it might just be that something else is is more appropriate um at, at, the, at the moment um and so i think we I guess what I would really like is to know that there were really kind of well thumbed copies of the guide in uh, that people that people had at home, and so you know if they were thinking about oh actually maybe I need something a bit different, they would go back to it and have another look. Um, yeah. So this is hopefully not a, not a kind of a one time resource. Thank you, Alison. Um... Saw some uh, comments in the chat about different languages. It would be useful to have it in, and we would love to do um, further translations. Um, obviously, that's going to be dependent on funding and resources, but um, fingers crossed for the future. Um, and again, please do fill in the survey on the National Bereavement Alliance website if you want to suggest things like different translations or if you have ideas for where we can disseminate the, um, uh, the guide as well. That would be very much appreciated. Um, let me have a look. Where are we? 
So um, we've sort of covered hope some of this already, but I thought it'd be useful to talk a little bit more about our sort of hopes and expectations um, for what's going to happen next with the guide. Um, so, for example, the updating process, Emily, maybe you could um, tell people a bit about that. Yeah, so um, obviously we all know that service services change and, you know, what they provide goes out of date. So it is really important that we do review the, the guide and update it from time to time. Um, we kind of thought of this first version really as a bit of a pilot in a way um, and that we'll so we plan to revisit it after six months so I think it would be if it takes to mark you know March April next year um, and yeah we'll, so each time we do it we will obviously go through and check that all our links are still working that the services still offer what we um, we're saying they offer that's really important um, and then after that, I think we'll be and yeah, using the feedback from the survey, if people leave us feedback in the survey um, to make any revisions. And then I think after that, we'd probably plan to move to a, an annual kind of revision of the guide. Um, and so because of that, um, you know, when we're asking services or organisations to to you know promote the guide for us or use the guide, um, if they're using it on their websites, we, we're asking people to link to the page that hosts the guide rather than host a copy of the, the guide, because obviously the guide will change and it's just important that people have up to date information. Um, so that's how we um, envisage it working, really. And, and our need to be able to keep it up to date is that people link to rather than host direct copies of the guide. Um, but to help people do that, what we've done is we've um, on on the National Freedom Science website where the guide is, we've also got a page with um, uh, sort of um, material that people can download to help them share information about the guide. There's a flyer people can use on their website. We've put some suggested text that people can use. Um, and we've also, um, there's a downloadable poster as well that people could print off and, you know, for example, put in GP waiting rooms or in pharmacies or in funeral homes, any kind of physical setting, um, which, ha again, has a little bit of information about the guide and also has a QR code and the website details so that people can um, also access it in that kind of physical setting. Um, and I think our idea really for the guide is that we wanted it to work as a digital resource um, and it does work better as a digital resource because um, we've got lots of links in it. Um, but we also wanted it to work for people who you know, maybe did, wanted it as a hard copy or that just was how it was given to them. Um, so, yeah, we have included lots of phone numbers. There are you know, websites in it as well that people could um, you know, search up. Um, and then also within the guide as well, we've also got our website detail and the QR code. So if somebody's reading it as a paper copy, they could um, and wanted it as an electronic copy, they can then download it as an electro electronic copy. So it's important that it worked in both both ways. Brilliant. Thank you, Emily. Um, I thought it would be uh, time to look over at the questions that have been coming up. One of them was about physical copies of the guide. Um, and as Emily said, you know, our hope is that people will download the guide and print it um, from the website. So we don't actually have any hard copies available, do we? Um, so please do um, share it, download it, print it out. Um, again, yeah, if you have suggestions for um, getting um, a whole batch printed or ways we could do that or disseminate that, please let us know through the survey. Um, but I think it does work well if we keep it um, online because we can keep it updated um, and make sure it doesn't go well that it doesn't ha happen what happened to me where you get given a guide and then you go home and you call the number and the number doesn't um, isn't in service anymore um so another uh another question here so does the guide provide faith aspects of grief not so much and we haven't focused on faith because we didn't want to for example have a section on each of the different faiths so again i think this is about um trying to curate something which is going to be um, generally useful um, but also signpost to more specific cultural and faith resources emily yeah i mean so we do have a um the last table at the end of the guide it has um it has a few examples of um support services for people from different cultural and faith groups um, but they they are, you know, there will be a lot more out there, but we did want to give some examples where there were nationally available examples available, we included those. Um, and then, yeah, but I think that's probably as far as we could go with, you know, having just one one guide available, really. Yeah. Um, and another point here, how accessible is the guide to people with communication difficulties and adults with learning difficulties? 
So we haven't specifically developed um, a kind of easy read or pictorial version of the guide yet. And we would really like to do that. And we'd like to develop an animation as well. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to cross our fingers that we have the resources to do that. Um, did you want to add anything else on that, Emily? Or no, I think that would just be something that, you know, we talked about as, you know, potentially an area of future work, really, if we're able to, you know, access some funding to go on to develop that, that would be a really important thing to do. Um, yeah. Um, so this is an important question. So from TB in the audience. So Amber, you mentioned sort of timings. Um, when is the best time to give information or signposting? As a patient and family liaison nurse, often working with bereaved families, it's hard to know when to approach the notion of support. As you said, it can be overwhelming and we want to try to ensure we give the information when it will have the most impact for the family. Um, any reflections on that? Alison, I don't know, this must be something that's come up a lot um, in your work. Yeah, it does. I think um, uh, just a couple of reflections. Um, one is that um, it's quite helpful for, for the offer of support to be made rep repeatedly. So in some ways, not to not to not to worry too much about you know finding exactly the right time because um, probably hearing hearing about support from you know from a variety of different sources so it might be hearing about support um, being being told at the hospital and being told by the funeral director and you know maybe having finding a, a card for the at a loss website or or, or something there's I, I think there's it's actually quite helpful if people are kind of being repeatedly um, reminded about the support that um uh, that is um that that's available um and then i suppose just in terms of kind of you know what time is it is so there's that's about the, what time is it most helpful to 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 hear about support and then when is it most helpful actually to get support actually that varies so much for people partly depending on you know what is the support that's available so um you know for somebody who's wanting to access one to one support it might actually be it may be more helpful to do that once um the Kind of the very very early stages when lots of people are are, are around and and offering um support from you know from from family and friends once some of that has kind of um ebbed a, a, a bit that may that may be a more more helpful time to to, to seek out that one-to-one -one support but for example if the support that you need is help with having a conversation with children in the family about how to explain the funeral to them then obviously you need that support really early on so it's partly about that yeah thinking through what is what's the what's the kind of support that's going to be most helpful at at, at different points um, and that will vary for um for, for everybody so again hopefully having that kind of that range of support um within the guide helps people think about, okay, this might not be quite right for me at the moment, but something else might be. And I did also notice a point in the in the chat about, um, about waiting lists. And we know that access, particularly for one-to-one -one support can be, it can be long and that can be really hard for people and so having some of the other opportunities within the guide about some of the some of the self-help resources and um, some of the podcasts like Amber's um, which can be used kind of alongside um, waiting for a different types of support um, so yeah thinking about some of the timings there sorry Amber did you want to come in no, yeah, what you said initially about a, a repeatedly is words out of my mouth. I don't think it's uh, it can often feel like a strike while the iron's hot kind of thing before they leave the hospital after their person's died, before they leave the hospice in the GP. You think, oh, do I see this opportunity? I do think it is about repetitiveness because so many stories I've heard through people is they leave whichever sort of you know uh, the hospice the hospital the GP and it's a one conversation when really potentially a month down the line a couple of months maybe just down the line someone to prompt the guide again FYI do you remember the guide I shared with you have you had a thought about it that person might ignore you they may come back and go actually I am I think I'm ready to have a look at the guide or look at the offer of support that you've given and yeah I saw the comment as well about the the sort of longer waiting list for um maybe professional support one-to-one -one, uh, counseling or therapy and that is where the, the mode sort of and um, support that I offer and plenty of other people uh, can really come in and slot quite well so 
um, it can be hard as as professionals wanting to, you know, if you are choosing the moment to share the resources while knowing uh, actually there's quite a long wait list, there might be quite some barriers. It's good to yeah then know um, within the guide and generally what's going on and available in local communities online resources such as mine where you can say to someone, look, I know there's a long waiting list, but you're not alone because sometimes when you hear oh there's barriers there's long waiting lists that can immediately just throw somebody back and go well I'm not going to bother them if if it's not accessible and sometimes people are coming in places of crisis and it's well like I did I didn't really I didn't feel within my mental well-being that I had the luxury to kind of wait I was quite scared of, um, of what the feelings that I was feeling so if my GP at that time I've offered me uh, some sort of resources books podcasts peer, peer to peer support groups I wonder, yeah, how much that, you know, whilst waiting potentially for professional support later down the line, um, should I have come arrived at that professional support, how I may have been, may have approached it differently. And actually, sometimes if people are given the support in between, such as resources, finding peer to peer support, sometimes they when it comes to the time of them actually accessing that one-to-one -one support they sometimes feel they don't need it and that is sometimes a bone of contention between of where professionals might share it in fear of the user not being actually wanting to use their services eventually but it's I think you know it's a great thing if somebody has found another mode of support um, during that time of waiting and eventually come to that support and may not need it but might need it further down the line so yeah really echoing what you were saying there Alison I think it is about repetitiveness checking in multiple opportunities for that person to say yeah you know what I think I'm ready to explore what options I have available to me now thank you thanks both that's really helpful and there's another question here from JC it seems there's a lack of bereavement support for people with learning disabilities after 25 years of trying I've only found one group of therapy session through my local learning disabilities team I'm now having having EMDR therapy um, JC, I'm really sorry that that's um, what your experience has been. That sounds really difficult. Um, there are some resources which are flagged in the guide. And I'm also, I'm just going to put it in the chat now, but there's a, a section on the Good Grief Hub, which is our sort of resources section of our website on um, yeah, learning disabilities and, and grief. And there's a couple of organisations that are flagged there. And one of them is Respond, um, which do some yeah, really um, important work with people with learning disabilities. I hope that helps and um, perhaps helps you um, find some other support if you find that you need something beyond the EMDR as well. Um, but thank you for your comment. Um, another one here um, from JC, I don't know if this is the same JC, maybe. Um, in my experience, I've felt really let down by our local GP and hospital when it comes to compassion at the end of life. Is it common for doctors and nurses not to be very helpful for the end of life? Again, I'm just really sorry that that's what your experience has been. That sounds um, really difficult. I think, sadly, the reality is that the quality of care can be quite mixed uh, in different places. And I think communication is an area that often comes up as a source of difficulties and complaints in, in when someone has a serious illness. Um, and we really hope that the grief support guide, for example, will be a good resource for GPs so that um, if, for example, at the moment they may only know about crews or they may know about at a loss, but they might not know about, um, you know, other other services and support that's out there. Um, or they may not know where to point people to those signposting organisations like Atalos and the Good Grief Trust. So we hope that the Grief Support Guide will help support um, doctors and nurses and the work they do with people as well. Um, but I'm sorry that that's what your experience has been. Um, what else do we have here? So somebody asking about specific support for people who are autistic. Um, I'm actually not aware of any specific support um, for people with autism. I don't know if you are, Alison, if you're aware of anything that's out there. I think there, I think there, there are some resources. I'm pretty sure that Leeds Bereavement Forum have put together a really good resource um, uh, for autistic people about the different types of support and um, including some of the, um, the videos that are, are, are available. Um, I will in a moment I'll see if I can find the, the link to that and put it put it into the chat. Um, and I think increasingly as well, there is um, 
training on on offer to those working in bereavement services about working with autistic people um, and thinking about the, the need to be um, welcoming to, to neurodiversity in, in all its forms um, in, in supporting bereavement. Again, you know, as we were saying earlier, this is something that kind of gets right to the core of our identity, isn't it? And, and so there is something really important about um, services being able to respond to that, but also um, all of us kind of having um, uh, the the language and the openness, I think, to be able to 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 to, to support um, to support one another. So yeah, if I can find that link, I'll I'll put it into the into the chat in a moment. Um, I hope as well. I mean, I think you know, kind of coming back to the kind of the core purpose of the guide, which really is to explain the different types of support. Um, that are available. Um, I hope that having having those kind of those those explanations of um, kind of what can be expected in those different forms of support. I hope that 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 is helpful um, as well, because that really that really is the sort of the I suppose the the, the main ethos of, of, of the guide is is really helping people to understand the, the different types that are available. Thank you, Alison. And I think I found the resource that you were talking about, so I popped it in the chat, but please check and see if that was the right one. It looks like I had some useful links to organisations and blogs and articles um, about that's autism nice. and grief, so I hope that's helpful. Um, another question here about uh, how are we distributing the guide? So um, we are distributing the guide through all of our networks and um, hopefully also through everybody on this call. Um, and it's freely available to download from the National Bereavement Alliance website. So, um, you know, if you wanted to print out copies, please um, go ahead and do that, as we said. Um, a question here about living losses. So any thoughts or specific suggestions from the team about living loss support, for example, adult children who've chosen to cut off their parents? Um, so the guide itself is focused on grief after bereavement rather than um, those really painful, sometimes living losses. Um, we have got some resources on the Good Grief um, Festival website on living losses. I'll put, pop those in the chat as well. Um, and we've also done, um, our, we did a mini festival um, a couple of months ago, or in September, I think, um, on grief at the end of a relationship as well. And you might find some of those, um, some of that content helpful. So if you go to um, the Grief channel on YouTube, you'll be able to access um, some, of, some of that content. Um, let me put the living losses link in there. I hope that's helpful. Um, and I think we've got time for one more question. So let's have a look. So somebody here is saying, did you consider putting the resource up in an online format with reviews and live input from end users? A more organic, easily editable format, maybe. Um, I like that idea. However, I would have a few concerns just about um, I think, as you know, as we've tried to describe, we developed this in a really step by step ways of working with stakeholders and bereaved people. And I would just be a little bit wary about putting something like that up there, which has been developed in that way um, for people to kind of live edit and change. Um, just knowing that people might be downloading it and we won't know exactly what it is that they're, they're da downloading. Um, but we do hope that the. Uh, by having the survey there that you can link to that people can kind of give us um, feedback that we can review as a group um, and make decisions you know across everybody's feedback that we've received because obviously one person might say oh, I really hate the design and I want it to be a different color and another person might say I really love the design and I really love the color or the font so it's just I think you have to be a little bit careful about that kind of editing process that we do it um, fairly and in a kind of considered way um, I think as well um, that um, yeah that um, that because it it sounds almost like a bit sort of like a kind of trust pilot type um, uh, type type approach that's that's being suggested, which is a really it's a really interesting um, uh, idea. I guess it's that also just a, as as a reminder. So the guide is is kind of talking about the different types of support, and then there are some examples of uh, of national support, um, but it doesn't have all of the all of the um, hundreds of local services um, that are available. So those can be those are linked through to um, on the Atalos 
um, website and, and Good Grief Trust. Um, and so that huge range of, of services, um, uh, yeah, that would be a, a really significant job to have that kind of that um, uh, that, that sort of live feedback. Um, but I know yeah. that um, Atalos are doing very regular um, checks of the information on those local services that are on their website. So um, so that, yeah, that they can be confident that that information is up to date. Okay, thanks, Alison. And I think this might be the person who made that comment saying, um, was thinking more about being able to review a service online. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I imagine you can review bereavement services um, via Google and things like that. But um, yeah, that's sort of outside the remit of what we were trying to do um, with this guide. Um, I just also wanted to acknowledge a, a couple of the other comments in the chat. Um, one from Trish saying they lost their um, 19 year old grandson to suicide and her daughter wasn't offered any help and had to phone the police to try and find out what she needed to do. Um, I just want to say how awful that sounds and I'm just really, really sorry to hear that. I think, um, yeah, the support that we provide to breed people every step of the way needs to be more informed and more compassionate than it often is. I think the reality is that people's experiences are quite patchy and there needs to be more um, yeah, more and better education, I think, for people who are encountering bereaved people, especially in those initial stages when you're feeling really raw um, and providing the practical kind of guidance that we've tried to flag in the support as well. It's so there's so many things you need to do, isn't there, after someone um, dies. It's that like sad men, I've heard it called, you know, that's just could be really overwhelming as well. Um, so I'm just very sorry to hear that, Trish. Um, and just, yeah, I think yeah I just want to thank everyone really for all of the um the comments we haven't had a chance to kind of go through it all now but we will review everyone's comments from the chat um after this webinar so um thank you all so much for joining us and to all of the panelists is there anything else anyone want, would like to say before we close no just thank you for listening and I hope you find it helpful and I yeah. guess a big a big thank you to everyone for being part of the network of support around bereaved people. Um, I think, you know, collectively we can do so much more to help people get to the support that they need. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, huge thanks um, to all of you for joining us. You really appreciate it. Um, do have a look at our YouTube page and, and sign up. And um, if you go to our website, goodgrieffest.com, you can also sign up to our newsletter. Um, and we can then email you about all our future events and activities. Before we end, I just wanted to flag the Grief Academy. If those of you um, joining today might be aware of it, but next year we're running a series of masterclasses, which are slightly longer sessions, um, and it's £50 to sign up for the masterclass for six months. And we've got some really exciting speakers and the opportunity for more extended Q&As at the end um and yeah i'm really looking forward to it it's a great opportunity to do more of a deep dive into grief and bereavement so if you're a professional um supporting bereaved people or encountering them in your everyday work or if you're a member a bereaved person or a member of your community supporting bereaved people do think about um signing up and i will see you there and um, thank you all so much um take care and yeah have a good week <laughs>